The first reading is from the New Testament, the book of Luke, chapter 2, verses 8 through 20. That can be found on page 805 in your pew Bibles if you care to follow along. Listen to the word of God. And in the same region, there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. When the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning this child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured up all these things, pondered them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told to them. This is the word of the Lord. Our second scripture reading is from the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verses 29 through 34. That is found on page 833 in your pew Bibles, should you wish to follow along. And again, let's listen to the Word of God. The next day, John the Baptist saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who ranks before me because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but for this purpose I came baptizing with water that he might be revealed to Israel. And John bore witness. I saw the Spirit descend from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. I myself did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, He on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and have borne witness that this is the Son of God. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. May God add his blessing to the reading and to the hearing of this, his holy word. Well, we have heard the story of the shepherds so many times, but have we ever stopped to imagine what it must have been like to go through what they experienced? I mean, put yourself in their place. You're out in the fields. You're keeping watch over your flocks overnight, which means it's probably springtime because that's the time when shepherds would stay in the fields with their flocks because it was lambing season. And so the shepherds would stay with the sheep rather than penning them up overnight because it was better for the ewes giving birth to their lambs. They could watch over the lambs and make sure that they were protected and safe. It was probably a cool night. The sky was full of stars. The sheep were bleeding around you. And then all of a sudden, an angel of the Lord appears, and the glory of the Lord shines around you, and we are told they were filled with great fear. Literally, it says they feared a great fear. I mean, of course they did. I've never personally seen an angel, but let me tell you, if one suddenly appears in front of me, I'm probably going to fear a great fear, 
when that happens. And the glory of the Lord shone round about them. Folks, do you realize how incredible that is? Because at this point in history, the glory of the Lord, the cloud of God's great glory, often called the Shekinah, it had not been seen, it had not appeared on the earth for more than 500 years. The glory of the Lord had not been seen. This physical manifestation of God's presence and greatness had withdrawn from God's people. It hadn't been seen for centuries ever since it left Solomon's temple before that building was destroyed in 586 B.C. But now suddenly again, the glory of the Lord appears to these shepherds out in the fields, keeping watch over their flocks by night. And as the glory appears, the angel declares what God's people had been waiting even longer to hear, that unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is the Christ, the Messiah, the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. And then suddenly there was with that one angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. Now, those of you that have read your Old Testament, you know that it is rare even for one angel to appear, but a multitude of angels, the whole heavenly host of angels appearing and holding a worship service up in the sky, that is unheard of. That just didn't happen. These shepherds must have been absolutely overwhelmed. But perhaps one of the reasons that these particular shepherds were given this incredible honor is that these shepherds served a very special purpose. Bethlehem was and is only four or five miles away from Jerusalem, and these shepherds probably were the shepherds in charge of keeping the flocks of sheep that supplied the temple in Jerusalem. And among other things, they raised lambs that were sacrificed on the altar in that temple, two times a day, in fact, a, every morning and every evening, a perfect spotless, one-year-old male lamb, without spot, without blemish, without defect, was sacrificed on the altar in the temple. And that's in addition to all of the other sacrifices that were offered by people for their personal worship and all of the sacrifices that were offered on high holy days. So as you can imagine, the temple needed a lot of lambs. These were the special shepherds that raised and cared for these lambs. And there is a tradition, now we can't confirm this after all these centuries, but there is a tradition over all of these years, and it's really intriguing, that these shepherds in particular, when the male lambs were born, would swaddle them, would wrap these male lambs in cloths to protect them to keep them from getting injured or getting hurt after they were born. Remember, all of the male lambs offered had to be perfect. There couldn't be any scars, there couldn't be any defects, there couldn't be any accidents that had happened, no blemishes on them. They would then lay these swaddled lambs in a manger, a rough stone feeding trough that would offer a little more protection for the lambs so that they wouldn't squirm away and, and hurt themselves. Again, as I said, that's a tradition. We can't prove that. But if it's true, and I'd like to believe it is, you can imagine that when these shepherds 
heard the angels announce that the baby who was born would also be wrapped in swaddling cloths and would be laid in a manger, that they would know exactly what that meant. In fact, these are some of the only people on earth who would know exactly what that meant. Namely, that this child, this Savior who was born in that village right down there, over there, that this child was born to be sacrificed like a lamb. And the sacrifice of a lamb, there is ample precedent for that throughout the Old Testament. If you go all the way back to Abraham, Abraham was called by God to offer his son Isaac on an altar. Amazingly, Abraham obeys. He trusts that somehow God will protect and save Isaac. In fact, he even tells Isaac along the way as they're traveling to the place of the sacrifice, as Isaac gets inquisitive, Abraham says God himself will provide a lamb for this sacrifice. And they travel up Mount Moriah, which, by the way, is the same mountain in Jerusalem where the temple is centuries later built. Abraham builds an altar. He lays Isaac on it. He takes a knife in his hand. And then at the last minute, an angel appears and shows him a sheep nearby caught in the thicket. God indeed provided a lamb, and Abraham sacrificed that in place of his son. Centuries later, when God delivers his people from their slavery in Egypt, he commands them to celebrate the first Passover, and part of that celebration involves the sacrifice of a lamb and the smearing of the blood of that lamb on the doorposts of their houses, so that when the angel of death comes to take away the firstborn of Egypt, When the angels saw that blood, the blood of the lamb that had died as a sacrifice, the angel passed over that house, and the firstborn inside were saved. Later in the law, God prescribes that a lamb was to be offered as a guilt offering for sin. And indeed, as I said, two times a day in the temple, a lamb was offered for this very purpose. And in the book of Isaiah, the prophet tells us that the Messiah, who was at this point yet to come, would be a suffering servant who would be like a lamb to the slaughter. So I know it's a really bad joke, but when the angels appeared in the sky, the message that they were giving to the shepherds was, Mary had a little lamb born to be sacrificed for us and for our sins. And the principle behind all of this is the principle of substitutionary sacrifice, because the punishment for sin is death. God decreed that all the way back in the very beginning, in the Garden of Eden, that whenever we sin... We deserve to die for that sin because our sin is a rebellion against God. It is a deep offense against the one who created us, the Lord of the universe, our Lord and Master. And as I said earlier in the service, our God is a God of justice. He demands that the price of sin be paid. God cannot, God will not sweep those sins under the proverbial rug. God cannot, God will not wink at our sins and say, oh, well, you know, it's no big deal, because it is a big deal. It's a very big deal. It's a grave offense. Our God is holy. Our God is completely and totally and utterly good, and He cannot and He will not tolerate evil in His presence. It just isn't right. But God is also a God of mercy. And it is not his will that we should all die for our sins. It is not his will that we should all be wiped out for our sins. And so a substitute is needed. One who can take that punishment that we deserve 
so that the justice can be satisfied, so that the price of sin can be paid, and at the same time, so we can be saved from our sins. And in the Old Testament, this whole idea was modeled by all of those lambs being offered on the altar. The idea being that the lamb died in your place. It should be you up on that altar. It's your sins that are being punished. But the lamb died on your behalf. Now, as I said, that's only a model because no animal could ever die in our place and fully satisfy the demands of justice. For this to really work, a human being had to die for humankind. And this is what we are celebrating today. This is what God himself has done for us, that he himself, in the person of his son, came to become that human being, human in every way as we are, but without sin, born, as John the Baptist proclaims, to be the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He came to be that sacrifice that we need to take away our sin once and for all. That little baby who was born and swaddled in those cloths and laid in that manger walked a path in his life that led directly from that manger in Bethlehem to that cross on a hill called Calvary. It should be us on that cross. It's our sins that were punished there. He had no sin of his own, but he took our place. Proving once and for all, as Henry Wadsworth Longfellow wrote in our first hymn, God is not dead, nor does he sleep. That because Jesus became our lamb, now the wrong shall fail and the right prevail for peace on earth, goodwill to men. And all of this, all of this incredible gift that God has given to us, the gift of himself, the gift of our salvation, the gift of eternal life with him in glory, demands a twofold response from us, a response that the shepherds model for us in our first reading for today. Listen first to what Luke says. When the angels went away from the shepherds into heaven, they said to one another, let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste. They found Mary, they found Joseph, and they found the baby lying in the manger. In other words, the shepherds obeyed the word that they had been given by God. And they went and they found Jesus and they worshiped him. God has done this absolutely incredible thing. He has come down to us as Emmanuel. He has become the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. The only proper response is that we come before Him and we bow before Him and we lay our lives before Him. In other words, that we come and worship, worship Christ the newborn King. In a very small way, that's what we're doing today, isn't it? We've laid aside all of our traditions. We've laid aside the normal way that we do Christmas. And we have come to worship God here today, to keep Christ in Christmas. We need to follow this instinct all throughout the year. We need to obey what God is calling us to do. We need to worship Him each and every day. We need to serve Him, leave everything else behind like the shepherds left the sheep, and even when it is a great sacrifice, come and worship the Lord. When we live lives as living sacrifices in that way, God will bless us just as He blessed the shepherds. And then the second thing we must do 
because of all that God has done for us. Listen, listen to what it is here. When the shepherds saw Jesus, they made known the saying that had been told to them concerning the child, and they returned, glorifying and praising God for all that they had heard and seen as it had been told to them. This Christmas message is a message we cannot keep to ourselves. Like the shepherds, we need to testify. It's a part of our worship. It's a part of our obedience to God. Because again, what God has done is so great, and it's so wonderful, and it's so loving, and it's so merciful, and it's so kind. How, how many people are willing to give up their lives for you? How many people are willing to give up a son for you? Let alone how many other gods are willing to do this. I don't know of any. This good news is not good news that we can keep quiet. We have to go and tell. We have to worship and praise. We have to share this with everybody. So don't let this message, don't let this worship stop when you leave this room today. Don't just blithely go back to your cookies and your presents and your Christmas jammies. Don't just go back to your normal life, for God is not dead, nor does He sleep. He is Emmanuel. He has come to us as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, and that is the best news ever. So come and worship and keep on worshiping, and then go and tell and keep on telling, because Mary had a little lamb, Jesus Christ, our King. He's been born that He might die for us so that we might live. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. To Him alone be the glory. Let us pray. Indeed, Lord, we thank You for giving that greatest gift of all, for giving the gift of Yourself for coming as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Lord, we pray that this would move us deeply and profoundly in our hearts and minds, and that we would carry this message with us as the shepherds did, glorifying you, obeying you, and proclaiming your good news. We pray all of this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lamb. Amen.